When you think about glasses, and when, when I think about whether I'm going to go buy a pair of glasses, how important is it to the business that you actually donate another pair to someone who needs one? So our research has shown that for the consumer to actually buy the glasses, it's actually not that significant. So uh, when, when we've done focus groups, interviews, surveys, when we've observed people buying glasses, uh, the most important thing is how those glasses look on their face. So when we describe ourselves, we're, we're a fashion brand, we're a lifestyle brand that designs beautiful eyewear, uh, because that's the, the foremost reason why people buy glasses. Second, they think about price. Third, they think about quality and service. And fourth, if at all, our social mission. Uh, that's not to say that this, our, our mission, which is to transform the optical industry and to demonstrate that companies can scale, can be profitable, and can do good, um, but it, 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 it doesn't necessarily um, sort of help us make that first sale. There's this strong business rationale. It helps us retain and recruit top talent. Uh, it helps keep us motivated and excited every day. Um, and we think that it helps customers be more loyal and perhaps more likely to tell their friends, but we're not sure that it helps them actually make that first purchase. Okay, but when you started the company, why did you decide to do it this way then? Um, yeah, you know, I think all of us um, on the founding team, uh, so Neil and I and our, our two other co-founders, uh, we're just really passionate about creating an organization that did something good in the world. And um, we, we saw this massive industry, $65 billion worldwide, that really hadn't had any innovation. And we had the opportunity to disrupt that industry, provide great value to consumers. Um, and that was exciting to us. But um, we, we also just wanted to make sure that we create an organization that we were excited by uh, just getting up and, and going to work uh, to every day. And, and we wanted to just do something good in the world. OK, but you have some big name investors, some of whom are in this room. Um, who probably don't traditionally invest in fashion companies, and who I imagine can't really be thrilled that you're buying carbon offsets and giving away <laughs> glasses. Well, we, we think kind of everything we do on the social mission, whether it's um, you know, being carbon neutral as an organization, uh, distributing a pair of glasses for, for everyone that we sell, getting involved in the community, investing in our employees um, through executive coaching and a bunch of other things that, that um, certainly add to the expense uh, portion of our P&L. Um, actually enhance our brand. They allow us to attract and retain the most talented employees. They allow us to build close relationships with our customers. Um, and at the end of the day, they, they make us be a, a better business that is going to generate uh, positive returns for those investors that are motivated uh, purely uh, by financial returns. Jeremy, same question to you. I, 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 look, the sweater is gorgeous. The t-shirts are gorgeous. You're wearing one right now. If <laughs> I was going to buy one, I think I'd buy it because of how it looked. But you guys have a whole other ethos that's part of this. Yeah, so if we go back to that, um, to that kind of chance discovery, for me, I, I met a farmer who gave me a t-shirt from wool, which I hated, because I had to wear it when I was a kid, and I was so shocked because it didn't itch. But then I got into it, and I discovered that it was superior to the other products out there, because it was annually renewable, and it felt soft and it let my body breathe and we started doing sport in it with my friends. And when I got into the outdoor industry, I realized the whole outdoor industry was made from plastic. So every brand which was about connecting people with nature was using petrochemicals, right? It was polypro polypropylene or polyester. So here was this kind of undiscovered fiber that had just been ignored. So it was this brand new idea that was 5,000 years old and it just needed to be packaged. So I started off wanting to build a sustainable product, but when I spent time with the farmers and in the manufacturing, I really tried to focus on building a sustainable company because I didn't want to just make clothes. I didn't want to build a fashion company. I wanted to build an alternative to, based on something real. My, my thought was, in an age that's becoming increasingly unreal, the value of what is real goes up. And I think that's kind of behind some of these amazing founding stories and these new birth of businesses that are being born, you know, recently. I want to go back to Warby Parker for a second. I want to talk about glasses, just the business of glasses. We're going to put the social mission aside. We will come back to it. Um, glasses are typically ridiculously expensive, right? Yeah. A couple hundred dollars a pair, if not more. You guys sell them for $95. How? 
So the big thing is when you look at this industry, it's dominated by a few large players, uh, one of which is Luxottica, an Italian company uh, that is basically vertically integrated. So over the last, you know, 30 some odd years, they've been able to acquire every major company within, within every, the other. But am I wrong in saying virtually every major either glasses or sunglasses company, whether it's uh, Ray-Ban to exactly. so they own, is, is, is them. Yes, yeah, so they own Oakley, Ray-Ban, Oliver Peoples, Persol, Arnett. Uh, they license every major fashion brand, Ralph Lauren, Chanel, Prada, you name it. Uh, they own LensCrafters, Pearl Vision, Sunglass Hut, Sears Optical, and Target Optical. Um, and then the icing on the cake is they own the second largest vision insurance plan in the country. Um, <laughs> People so, talk about regulating uh, the tech industry. I don't know about uh, <laughs> maybe the glasses industry, but so, okay. Right. So our thought was, uh, what if we could design the frames that we love, uh, use sort of materials that you know, we were accustomed to buying, but work directly with the sort of suppliers, and then sort of bypass the industry, bypass the middlemen, and go direct to consumers by selling online. And with that, we could cut, sort of basically sell the same product, but for a fourth of okay, the price. What, what kind of margin are they getting, and what kind of margin are you getting? So typically glasses are marked up between 10 and 20 times what they cost to manufacture. 20 times. Yeah. And when you look also at the retail level, often those margins are 3 to 5x, whereas you know, typical apparel or accessories is like 2 to 2.5x. Two so you know, we're able to sort of give all that retail markup uh, to consumers. And because we've developed our own brand, we're not licensing a brand. That licensing fee we're able to give to consumers. So essentially, we're able to offer a product that normally costs five hundred dollars for for ninety five dollars right. by cutting out the the licensing fees and all the middlemen. When you think about, you've created a fashion brand, and now this is only a two and a half year old company. For those who, who don't know about it, but those who do, it is a it is a strong brand that actually means something. Um, what did you want it to mean, and how how did this happen in just such a little time period? Yeah, so we, we really wanted to design just glasses that we love. I, I lost a pair of glasses. They cost me $700, and I couldn't figure out why glasses cost more than an iPhone or an Android phone. Um, and so we, uh, we decided uh, you know, to, that we realized that we could create our own brand that really stood for beautiful design, uh, convenience, um, but at, at a great price point for, for customers. Um, and then we, we wanted to build a business that did something good in the world. And, um, and we think it's an inherent good to offer a product that normally costs $500 for $95, but then wanted to think about all the stakeholders that we touch. So um, our employees, the environment, uh, close to a billion people around the world don't have access to eyeglasses and they can't function um, the way that, uh, that all of us do. Um, why, why do you think life. nobody did this before? Why, did nobody, luck, why didn't nobody else try to undercut Luxottica? I think you see most disruption right, is caused by outsiders. It's not really sort of the insiders that are sort of benefiting from the status quo. So here were us, we, had, we were consumers. We had that experience walking into an optical shop, getting really excited about a pair of glasses and walking out feeling like we got punched in the face. Um, and uh, we had also sort of, we knew what it actually costs to manufacture glasses. Uh, I, I used to run a nonprofit that would train low income women in the developing world to start their own businesses actually selling glasses in their communities. Um, and one of the things that we found is that uh, people would rather be blind than wear a donated pair of 1970s cat eyes. Because uh, you just, you'd, you'd look ridiculous. And frankly, fashion matters no matter where you live in the world. Uh, you don't want to be ridiculed by your neighbors or friends. Uh, so we would design and manufacture our own glasses. And uh, I'd go to Asia and be sort of in these factories. And I'd see coming off the production line, sort of the, the glasses that we were sort of selling in places like Bangladesh and, and parts of rural India, um, alongside uh, some of the biggest names out there, uh, Marc Jacobs, Lan Vaughn, mm -hmm. you name it. Jeremy, you, you just said something interesting before. I, I don't know where you want to go with that. I, was well, just gonna... I, I just want to jump in. Please. I reckon you know, the rules of business have changed. So I started Icebreaker, <coughs> Icebreaker 16 years ago, and I had to go around with my samples and say, look, it doesn't itch, and get people to wear it. And it was bit by bit, right? So now you don't have to do that. If you guys wanted to start a business 16 years ago, or even 10 years ago, you had to be, you had to be a wholesaler. You, you couldn't afford to open your own stores. There was no online commerce. So the rules of business have totally fundamentally changed. And now as a traditional wholesale company, we can have our own stores. We've got 10 stores in the US. We can have an online business. We can supply thousands of outdoor stores around the world. And we can do it all at once. 
So there's a massive scramble going on at the front end, which is creating a total rebirth of what these business models are. You said something interesting to me because it was, it was directly opposite what he just said, which was that you don't think of yourself as a fashion business. Why not? Well, companies are, are defined by their founding moments. And for me, it was about wanting to create a natural alternative in an age of synthetics. And synthetics, for me, meant stuff which is disposable. So look, I'm no purist here. I fly on airplanes. I wear Gore-Tex. But I didn't want to wear polyester and all those fabrics that stunk. I needed some Febreze <laughs> and all the problems that were associated with that. So any people in the outdoor industry will know the downside of that. So we kind of wanted to be the opposite. So when I launched Icebreaker, the brand was about people in nature, and it was about men and women. It used to be only about kind of sweaty men climbing mountains. So we wanted to redefine what the outdoor industry was about. And also, we wanted to make products that lasted. So I want our products to last for five, five years or seven years. Uh, our products um, have styling, but they're not fashion products. I want them to look good with what you want to wear in three years. So we're trying to build in values. So our product is more expensive than a, than a typical outdoor product. And I think it's better value because it lasts longer and you can do more in, uh, uh, right. do more in it. So it depends what you optimize for. So we're optimizing for long-term customer value, not short-term right. value. Let's talk about the future of retail a little bit. You started your business, as he just said, online. And in many ways, you're going backwards, right? You're starting stores now. Uh, you're starting your first store in New York City. What's that about? Does it have to happen that way? Um, we do think that the future of retail is some intersection between bricks and mortar and, and e-commerce. Uh, when, when we were thinking about the business, the thing that we, we couldn't sort of get over was would people buy glasses online if they couldn't try them on first? And, and that was uh, sort of, we would have sort of countless nights sort of talking, sort of trying to figure this out. And we came up with this idea to do a home try-on program where people could select five frames, we ship it to them free of cost, and they have five days to try on those glasses at home uh, before actually purchasing and before we put the prescription lenses in and ship it to us. We thought that that would sort of eliminate sort of the barriers to purchase, it would help reduce return rates, and when, when somebody returned something, we got it's, you know, scratch the lenses, and you know, it's, uh, the lenses are the biggest sort of part of the cost of goods sold. Um, what happened is that uh, when we launched, we launched the features in Vogue and GQ, and the company just took off like a rocket ship. We hit our first year sales targets in about three weeks, sold out of our top 15 styles in four weeks, and had a wait list of about 20,000 people, and we had to immediately shut down the home try-on program. And people started calling up and saying, hey, I heard you're in Philly. At the time, we were, we were full-time students at Wharton. Um, and they said, can we come by your office? And we said, uh, you can come by our apartment. Um, and, and people would come in, and we'd lay the glasses on the dining room table. And you know, at first, we thought this was going to be a very suboptimal experience. Uh, but what we found was that it ended up being a very special experience because uh, these customers uh, had a chance to meet the people behind the brand, which is pretty rare these days. And, and we sort of created these amazing like super advocates. Right. Um, so when we moved back to New York and set up our office, we set up a showroom in the office. Uh, we, we've now moved on to our second office where we have a showroom in about 600 square feet. Last month we did over $220,000 worth of sales, um, you know, selling a $95 product. On a, on a sales per square foot basis, there's only like two, two retailers that are really beating that, like Tiffany's and, and, and Apple. Um, so we now had uh, sort of the, the customer service component, like, how, wow, this, this sort of helps. Um, and that we can do it profitably, why not try to experiment and, and do this in other ways? So uh, we've partnered with some sort of cool boutiques around the country that sell you know, many leading sort of contemporary uh, apparel lines, and we'll, uh, and we'll rent sort of a wall from them to display our glasses, and then we'll pay for a staff person there uh, to oh. sort of uh, take people's orders on a tablet, runs actually through our website, we ship it to them. Uh, and now we're opening up our first flagship store right on Princeton Green in Soho, uh, next to Ralph Lauren across from Apple, uh, because we, we think that this will help uh, sort of really anchor the brand, because there's never been a major fashion is brand Is the dream online. Of, of, of online only, of online only retail, is that dead? Meaning does there have to be 
Maybe you could speak to this. Is there, does there have to be a touch component? Has Apple proved that people actually want to touch the stuff? Well, this is my obsession at, at the moment. So we sell in, in 40 countries, right. and 80% and of the business is still wholesale. But I know, you know the, my role is to learn what I need to change about myself and about my company, right? So it's, the next five years is about changing that percentage to at least 50% direct. We just see this triangle. Wholesale at the top. The role of wholesale is to give everyone the first touch. The role of retail is a high touch, personal experience. The role of online is obviously convenience and depth of storytelling and repetitive. So there's kind of harvesting mechanisms and then there's nurturing mechanisms, which is more the online. So that sounds like I know what I'm doing. If you, if you know what you're doing, can you help me? <laughs> yeah. um, it's a work in progress, right? But I've got a clear vision of how we need to evolve um, the brand and the model. Can I just pull up one slide? I just want to Go for something. it. So the company is a little bit different because this is our fiber factory. So it's not a normal sheep that sits there reading grass. And he lives in the Southern Alps. If you go to the next slide. So we buy about, if you go to the next one, we buy a quarter of the merino wool, which covers two million acres. Now, if I can tell that story to my customer, they realize they're not just having some mass-produced product. There's this whole kind of backstory about a product that's born in nature. Now, if I can't tell them that, I'm just another t-shirt guy. Do you know what I mean? Right. And I'll just show you a final slide. So the whole thing then is about transferring that story into stuff that you can wear. But I want people to actually feel that experience. Now, in a wholesale environment, when I've got that much of REI, you can't do that. In your own retail stores, like in Soho, we're around the corner, or online, you can do that. So it's actually coming about storytelling vehicles. The thing is, those stories have to be true. And the founding stories that you're telling are what people connect with. So there's this new age of storytelling being born. You know, in the last session with Lila and Linda, um, Linda in particular talked about, and, and Lila, but both of them did, this sort of new generation of social purpose and social mission. And, and I wanted to end on this issue, which is profits. Um, when you think about your business, is there a cap on profits for yourself, either a salary that you take, um, the way you think about the business? Uh, you, you obviously, everybody here is involved in, in, in a sustainable business. How, how do you think about that issue? Do you want to take Who salary to take caps? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we actually take the probably the opposite point of view, where we're, we're out to prove that a business, is, a business can be scalable and really profitable while, while doing good in the world. Um, and so we don't think that organizations should have to make a choice and that the, the next great brands of, of our generation are going to be built um, you know, as businesses that solve real problems um, and, and create value for customers, but, but also do good in the world. And, um, but let me, let me ask you, Neil was saying to me during lunch that a lot of the people that have come to work for you come to work for you because of the social, the social mission. That is the purpose. Absolutely. If they see this company making billions of dollars, God bless you if you do, how does that change the dynamic? I think it's all about the impact that we have, um, and, and we try to be really transparent. Um, and you know, I think both our employees and our customers are demanding transparency and authenticity. Um, and so, as an example, last year we published an annual report, um, which wasn't like a typical annual report. It was pretty sparse on financials, but uh, we gave people kind of an inside view on the impact that we were having and um, kind of little tidbits about our team, um, you know, the, the breakdown of the types of bagels that we eat at our kind of weekly team meetings. And um, I, we, we just wanted to uh, kind of provide a, a window into how our company operated, and that was tweeted out thousands of times, and it drove our three highest consecutive days of sales and um, really created a ton of engagement between us and our uh, consumers. And um, I think just millennials in general um, want information. They want to understand kind of the impact that they're having, and, and we just want to provide that transparency to, to everyone in our organization and, um, and the people that we interact with outside of our organization. Jeremy, I'm going to leave you with the last word on this. Um, I love the tension of uh, profitable sustainability. So I don't want to, um, both these things are critical, right? We must have profitable businesses. I love Eric's piece of advice, do not run out of cash. So it's a good piece of advice. So we in the business view profit as like the lifeblood. But how we make that is what's important. So 
Um, I believe that our customers have a shared value. It's not everyone, it's the people who care. We're trying to create a conscious business, we're appealing to people with a conscience. So we have to deliver a company and a product with deep integrity, and people will pay a premium for that. So for me, the thrill is trying to make profit and sustainability an and, not an or. Okay. Gentlemen, thank you for the conversation. This was really very special. Thank you very, very much.